So I'm super glad to be joined by Ron Ron Malhotra. I don't know if my pronunciation is on point. You can maybe correct it if you if you want. Um, I think many of you may already know him because he is a podcast host himself, and I was happy to be a guest on on your Sports Tech All-Star podcast before. And the name of your podcast is actually the topic I would be happy to, to dive into a bit today, the, the state of the sports tech field and the big themes you are seeing and how you look at this field. I mean, here we, in over the last episodes, we kept it very Web3 centric, even aside from the, from the sports market. But of course, that is a very important, important market for us. And so, happy to be joined by you. But before we get into things, probably you want to give a quick uh, introduction of yourself to the part of our audience that may not yet know you and what you're doing with uh, your podcast, with Sports uh, Tech X and so on. Sure, happy to. Um, hey, Thomas. Hey, Ron. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, pronunciation was okay. Not not too bad. Ron, um, for anybody else who cares, it's rhymes with stone, which is uh, maybe something we might like to do. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, what we do at Sports Tech X is, uh, yeah, we talk about what's happening in Sports Tech. Um, we're essentially market research or a market intelligence company. Uh, and my job and our team's job is to keep an eye on what are the latest trends in the world of Sports Tech, um, what's happening in different parts of the world. So we look at it purely from a startup investment perspective. So everything from like bottom up, um, and also looking at what's happening at the, at the elite pro level, what the sports teams are doing, but essentially we track who's investing in what, like how much, how much funding is going into startups in the U.S. versus Asia versus Europe, etc. Which startups are raising money? Which investors are putting in the money? Um, and then through that data, we extrapolate trends and we see what's happening, um, yeah, across the world, and then connect back to what you might see in the news. Uh, classic example, which I'm sure we'll talk about is NFTs. Um, so all this big craze that you see about people rushing, like some sort of gold rush, which is already run out. I don't know, depending on who you believe um, or what's happening. So we look at how much, how many startups there are, who the players are, what the teams are doing. So trying to connect the whole ecosystem and do that for um, yeah the entire world of that we call sports tech. And how did you get get into this? Do you have a background more in the, on the sports side, on the investment side, on the tech side? Now my background was is as an entrepreneur. Um, so I started my first startup well in 2009. I started my career in consulting. I was with KPMG. Mm -hmm. This is back in India in Bangalore. Um, yeah, did a nice three year stint with them. Had a great time. So actually, funnily, I was like a couple of projects that I worked on were around reports and creating like thought leadership because mm -hmm. that's what you know consulting companies do it's part of the functions that they do so i got a taste of it and i got a sense of how to structure things um then went and did uh, ran a startup for eight years in a completely unconnected uh industry which was actually uh, apparel textile we were doing uh like a diy make your own t-shirt kind of company mm -hmm. called alma mater in india um, All right. Yeah, it was pretty successful. We ran something. And after I exited that company, I was looking to make my next move. And sports just seemed like the right fit. Uh, sports tech was an emerging space in 2016, 17. Found the topic, loved it, dived right in, met Ben, who's my co-founder. And yeah, we gave sports tech X a crack. Cool. That's a, that's a cool story. And so what, I mean, you do these reports and I think everybody who is in the sports tech industry is aware of your, of your reports, but uh, I, I'd still be curious what are like the big topics you, you currently see, maybe even with an outlook to your upcoming reports, even though the last ones just dropped recently. I think one topic you, you mentioned already is NFTs. We are quite aware of this, but besides, besides this, with, which themes are you seeing and why are they so relevant? Dive right in. Yeah, go to the trends. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, maybe we can park the NFTs conversation because I'm sure that's stuff that you guys cover a lot. But also, I think the conversation is bigger around NFTs is, or it's rather Web3. and oh, We will get to yeah, it. We will get to it, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, the metaverse and all that jazz. But no, apart from that, there are a couple of ancillary industries. Fantasy sports and betting. 
uh, for example, is a is a big one, which also, of course, has a strong connection to Web three applications. Um, but we're seeing this, like, there's when you talk about sports betting, there's big money, right? And we're seeing a, a move to legalization of sports betting, which has taken place over the last two years, especially in the U.S. Now, when the biggest sports market in the world um, takes a topic like sports betting and legalizes it, you can imagine this. Tons of tons of money. For it. Waves. Yeah, exactly. And it has huge implications for the rest of the world. So just over the last, like I think 2018, uh, New Jersey passed the legislation, 2019 came into effect, 2020 onwards, we've started seeing this wave. I think it's about 30 states now, it's fully legal and another like 10 or 12 where it's about to be, I think only five or six states have decided to stay away from it. Um, Yes. Yeah, so just to clarify, yeah. Ron, you're talking about the um, uh, the ability for college students or college athletes to monetize their brands. No, no, no. That's name image. Okay. That's name image name image likeness NIL. That's, okay. That's a completely separate thing. I'm talking yeah. about purely sports betting. Sports yeah, betting. You okay. see an event. Um, yeah, whatever odds right. you get on it. DraftKings. Yeah. yeah. And again, so fantasy sports is separate, which is for fake money or play money, and then there's real money sports betting. Yeah, which is typical see odds, win, lose, draw, etc. cetera. Um, and the U.S. is trying to build around prop bets, which is over-unders, um, basically uh, a spread. I mean, I, I'm not the right guy to explain these kind of things, but... I, th I think I, I think you're talking about things like underdog, which is like a fantasy football application where you can kind of bet on like the over-under of, of scores. Sure. Kind of like... Yeah, yeah, that's, okay. that's again, what one, that's about. one part of it, but there's, type, yeah, yeah, now imagine um, it becoming much bigger. Now imagine um, instead of Underdog, which is maybe some obscure website, ESPN, which while you're watching the game is giving you a feed of odds right below the screen and press the red button to place a bet. Um, and it's becoming like plugged into every home and not just ESPN. I mean, if you follow US sports and US sports media, like the, the, the integrations into like the broadcasts even and, and written sports media, they, they've gone d down this rabbit hole quite a bit. And I mean, of course, the, the, it drives excitement, right? If you have money on the line for, for a given game, uh, it, it's just that much more exciting and, the uh, and, uh, what about what about because you mentioned fantasy sports of course there is also daily fantasy yeah. which is the hybrid where you play for real money based on based on outcomes and uh, one question that that we hear often but i'm by no means an expert maybe you have a more qu qualified take when will this reach uh, european football also known as as soccer as as a big thing because in the us it's so big but here it's like hmm not not really and why is that i think it's a cultural thing i think that's clear europe has just kind of treated sports betting or any sort of real money associated betting or fantasy with like a with like a barge pole you've kept it at an arm's length um so i think it's cultural it does happen for example in spain especially there are uh, quite large players which are Kind of those Siri, and you see this in Germany as well, or other parts of Europe. These are these tinted kind of rooms which you'll see in city centers, which are like gambling holes, which like slot machines kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Smoky, it's smoky smoky gambling rooms. All, all of those <laughs> things. Like that's how they're considered because they're dark and shady. It'll be in the city center, but it's got dark tints on the outside, right? It's not bright light and welcoming everybody in. That's how Europe has traditionally seen this. It's happening. UK, it's legal. Sports betting has been legal throughout, but it's kind of like the the dirty cousin, the yeah, the ugly sister, whatever you want to call it, just kept on the side. Um, but that's not the sentiment everywhere else. Um, for context, in India, daily fantasy or fantasy sports has exploded um, since twenty. Well, the company is called Dream Eleven, which started in twenty twelve. They really mm -hmm. hit scale in twenty sixteen and seventeen. Today, Dream Eleven is an eight billion dollar uh, at their last valuation. They're 140 million users plus, um, and there is like a nation of the cricket fan, uh, cricket fanatics who are jumping on the sport. Brazil in March passed, le passed legislation to legalize sports betting. Um, so when you take like these two huge economies, like mass mass market economies, 
and they're taking fantasy sports and betting quite seriously. And then you say, okay, US has done this. I mean, you, you can see the trickle down effect, like all the innovation that will happen in the US, there'll be players that will that leverage that and take it to markets like India and, and maybe China has different formats, but uh, Brazil, esports betting, I mean, it goes on and on. There's, there's a lot happening. I think- I think, Ron, one thing that you mentioned is kind of like this shady, dark approach here in Europe. And I think something that the United States tends to do pretty well with these types of things is like they'll take something that's typically like dark, maybe shady, maybe filled with regulation, and then they'll like gamify it. They'll take they'll make it where it's like attached to a to a to an RPG or like a a, a fantasy game. And I think that's what they're going to do. And that's going to like hit that major market and get those like you know, those fans who typically used to think that sports betting was such such a, I don't know, scandalous type of thing. Yeah, taboo subject. Man, yeah, spot on. Until two years ago, I think it was 20, uh, 2019, maybe pre-pandemic, 2019, so not 2020. But the NHL was the first league uh, which kind of said, okay, we're going to let some sort of sports betting sponsors in. The NFL kind of held it a little way. The MLB was on the fence. The NBA were the cool kids. So, and within like within no time, everybody, every league has signed their own deals, exclusive partners. They've embraced it wholly. Athletes are endorsing um, things themselves, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, they've taken it out of the dark and not brought it to the light, like yeah. shone the spotlight and said, hey, this is it. And, and this is so attractive. Um, you have seen it through the NBA playoffs. Steph Curry has is talking about cryptocurrencies and sports betting. Like there's so much going on. So. That's that's a whole other topic. Um, there, there's thing. some kind kind of cognitive dissonance almost, no? Because like foot, football here in Europe has has like bring me your money. The B wins, the typicals of this world. Yeah. So they, they had no no fear whatsoever to take the money, but still the image is the same. And then uh, and then yeah, just from a from a user experience perspective, I think like daily fantasy is so much more fun than just like the the old school results betting. I mean, you mentioned like there are new ways like prop deck then people are super bullish on like uh, uh, 5g powered live betting during the during the live games and then you can do all these all these what, what do you call these like these combination bets that you can that I you can do where you say pa- parlays, yeah yeah parlays yeah same game parlays and stuff that make it more exciting but i think da- daily fantasy is really something that from uh, from if i would be a, a huge soccer fan uh, and and reading and studying up, this would maybe be my preferred betting format. Um, but well, let's uh, let's see when it when it catches on, if if ever, over here in in a big way for, form. I, I've yeah. I've been playing fantasy fantasy Premier League. So Premier League is the league that we've always followed is since we were kids in India. It's the first league that was on TV. We have a we have a fantasy league between me and my my college group, my university group, since two thousand six seven. Nice. And every year, I won it last year, and man, that's a huge thing. Congrats. <laughs> I, actually, I actually spent... Humble brag. Oh, man, not even humble. You're kidding me. The win it is huge. Uh, and it's nothing. There's no money. There's nothing. It's just... Send this to your to your league mates. <laughs> yeah. Send this clip. I will. They'll be fuming. Um, and it's no money, no nothing. It's just pure pride. If you, could, if you think you know the sport you're talking about, show it. You know, pick the player, get the points, win the thing. Um, and that's what it is. Now, you take that pride and add a layer of, hey, I can make money. Yeah, that becomes really powerful. Yeah. yeah. And and some people did big time, yeah. especially like in the early days, like like all these people coming from poker to, to daily fantasy and so on. I remember some some interesting reported stories. So so okay, that was that was like the, the one big topic that you just, see. Is there just, is there a one, second just, major just, one? Uh, before I come to the second one, a great story. If if anybody knows Brentford FC, which is a Premier League team, which is built and owned now by a guy who made his money of sports betting. It's, it's a great oh, I didn't know this story. It's, it's, That's it's cool. It's a great story. And that is a club that is built on, yeah, everybody talks about Moneyball, and Moneyball is now an early 2000s phrase, even. Uh, but no, they embrace it and they live it. And all of because this is a guy who made his money through sports betting, use of analytics, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's, Rona, it's at the table. I, 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 I want to ask you something. Mm-hmm. Quick question. I mean, with this whole like Moneyball and like analytics type approach, like, I'm pretty curious in that topic and how analytics is going to come into football specifically or soccer. Um, I mean, we saw Kevin De Bruyne 
recently kind of, I think it, it was either his team or his social media team. And they kind of like pumped up his name and pumped up his, his, his reputation by using analytics. And they, I think they partnered with like an analytics. I mean, do you know anything about there? Do you know, like, what do you see in this whole realm of like analytics coming into sports? So KDB is a great example of a athlete taking ownership of their analytics and using it for his own contract negotiations. I'll give you another great example. That was with a company called Analytics FC, if I'm not mistaken. There's another great example, which I love. I mean, we know how teams use analytics as part of strategy, as part of uh, transfers, recruitment, etc. cetera. But uh, Memphis Depay, this is in 2018, I think, or 19, used a Dutch company called Sci Sports to use analytics to recruit his next team. When he was leaving Manchester United, he hired a bunch of guys uh, to analyze which teams across Europe Damn. would be best suited for his style of play. So he reverse engineered the recruitment. That's how he ended up mm -hmm. at Lyon. And then from Lyon, he, he did so well to end up at Barcelona after that, right? So it was a great move for them. Um, so, I mean, these are just some of the ways that analytics is being used. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised that's not more like widely used and widely, you know, embedded into these, into these uh, athletes. I, Crazy. I, I, I think, I think it already is. In fact, now there's a counter conversation. Um, there is a group, um, I forget the name. I have to look it up. But there is a group of footballers, um, not Rebel FC, I don't know what they call themselves, but basically they're, it's about 300 professional footballers who are setting up to protest the use of analytics against them in contracts. Because here's what's happening with biometric data and Europe gives you GDPR protection, right? Um, so how their data, we talked about sports yeah. betting and fantasy just now, their data is being used to make money for a lot of other people which is not for them, number one. So A, maybe they want a piece of that. And part B is um, how do I make sure that that data, which is my health data, if I'm injured, how my recovery is going, is not being used against me in a contract negotiations or is accessible to other teams, which might be my next team. So analytics is, is, not, is not the future. It's, not, it's very much here yeah. in every way, shape, or form. Uh, and now there are movements to... Yeah, it's a more nuanced conversation is becoming. I mean, I'm trying to think of it from the fans' perspective, too. I know, like, you know, the Super League was a perfect example or a, a perfect case study for how not to, I mean, for lack of a better word, Americanize football and Americanize such a grassroots sport. Um, and I'm trying to think about that from a fan's perspective. Like, I would imagine fans wouldn't like that either. If soccer became so much about analytics, I mean... Something like VAR getting introduced to football, you know, was was met with a lot of skepticism and, and a lot of actually dissent, you know, and like yeah. I, I would imagine that if if the game became so like like Memphis Depay on Lyon, such a fantastic tactical fit, like is that how football is supposed to be? Are players supposed to fit so seamlessly and tactically in these teams? Like they're supposed to be kind of this frankenstein type of thing in sports at least that's what i've always thought you know being a sports fan nothing is scripted nothing's over analyzed but yeah, it's, it's kind of it's, it's just interesting to think about it from like a grassroots I, point of view I, I mean i think i think i'm probably on the other side of the of the spectrum right like like one thing that that made me uh, get super super deep down the my, my NBA fandom rabbit hole. You both know that is the the my my main sport I follow was like when analytics became really a thing. Trying to understand this, trying to understand the game this way, and but but also understanding the limitations of analytics. And and there definitely basketball is a great sport. Maybe not as great as baseball because that's not really a team sport. But but you can still quite well analyze it. And there's been so much development and and progress in understanding the game and what i wonder in football I, I i would love more especially reported understanding of the analytics i don't know maybe maybe you you do 
if like on the inside in these teams, if they are so much more savvy than what the media uses, for instance, because that is like maybe the case, right? Maybe the teams understand everything super, super well, but just media, sports media for football doesn't use these these stats and analytics except like, yeah, there is expected goals, but what does that even mean? I mean, it's like on a, on a level, to give you one example, I see a lot of use of raw stats, like he played so many games, shot that many goals and, and the expected goals was this and that, but you should break it down in, in the NBA. You do it often on a per possession basis or per hundred possession basis or a time like per 36 minutes, which would make sense because then you have comparable data, but that is not what is being used in like where the main, where fans read about it. And I wonder Thomas, if, yeah, I, I think that only works on a macro level. If you're trying to like compare the entire NBA and all the players, I think then you could use that. But like, for example, on a micro level, if you're trying to compare like two two players and you're trying to say, well, you know, Westbrook, when th that season he was averaging a triple double, mm -hmm. his team was bad. Like, was he a better player than a Kawhi Leonard or than a, I don't know, a LeBron? No, no, of course not. I mean, I and, mean, and that that's is where it's like. Yeah, I think. Yeah, but that is, I, I, that, that is a, that, that is what why I spoke about the yeah. limitations of of stats, and you need to see these da data points in a context. Which, by the way, also the NBA because it's indoors, they have all arenas have these camera systems that that really track it. Now you have much more intelligent stats by now than even ten years ago because now you know what is this shot like a contested shot or is it an uncontested shot, and and that is the football much harder to analyze for various various reasons. But I but I still wonder. Uh, if we maybe you're right maybe it will not happen at least not in the, in the public domain but what, what is your take if you if you have one uh, how, how is it used inside of teams and organizations nowadays um it's almost like it's a, a to each their own kind of model I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep this quick i'll use the same example uh, that i gave the brentford uh fc right so brentford fc uh is a, is a story where the guy his name is Matthew, um, Matthew Benham or something. Um, he took 300K of, uh, or started with, I don't know, whatever, some amount of money, went to 300K, made that 300 million, which is how he bought a football club. And, that, and, and he used that level of analytics to seep through every element of that club. I remember a conference with the head of analytics of Liverpool, Champions League winning team, et cetera, the top of English football. And their head of analytics at a conference was talking about he does not talk to Jurgen Klopp, right? Jurgen Klopp is not interested in analytics. Like his data and his team does a lot of work. They pass on that data to coaches and he is not allowed to talk to players. Forget Klopp. He, Klopp doesn't, I mean, he would see him at the club, et cetera, but he doesn't interface with him much. Mm -hmm. He's not allowed to talk to players directly. His team is not allowed to go to players directly, right? What their job is to pass on the data to coaches and the coaches decide what data is then filtered through to uh, to the players based on the context. Data without context is nothing, right? So based on the context that is relevant to that player. At, on the same panel was the head of analytics for the Houston Rockets, I forget his name, um, who was saying that he used to ride the bus. He used to be there on the bus for the team, on the flights for the team. So any player, whoever wanted, not all of them do, but whoever wanted to go sit and chat with the analytics guy, they could do it directly. So past the coaches, past everyone, just go sit down with the analytics guy and see when I pick up the ball in the left block or I'm shooting over my left shoulder, like what is my conversion rate versus my right shoulder, stuff like that, you know, so he can go into whatever level of detail he wants. So again, it's bespoke to the team. Uh, some teams might embrace it in a deeper way. Other teams would say um, no. And I think that all stems from a managerial style. We saw this mm -hmm. many years ago, like Sam Allardyce was the first guy to talk about analytics in the Premier League. Um, and a lot of other coaches like Harry Neb Redknapp apparently couldn't, didn't know what a touchscreen was till, you know, till uh, he actually had an Apple product. So you have managers on either end of the spectrum, and they define that culture. Just just to bring this home a bit, I think football is a is a strange sport in the sense that this significant event is so rare compared to any other sport, right? So analytics yeah. will always inherently be skewed, which is why expected goals came up as a me as a measure to just try to bump up this rare event um and there is there are teams and teams of people who who look at it but the average fan 
now is getting more educated because these kind of numbers are being used. Like Sky Sports talks about expected goals. Like a lot of the broadcasters will, will do that. So it's coming into the lexicon of the average fan. Does it take away from it? I don't know. Um, as a purist, you might... It's just, it's just another thing that pisses me off <laughs> when I see at the end of the game that Bayern Munich lost like 1-0, but they had like an eight-goal expected goal. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, but <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, analytics. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. It's just another thing for you to justify that argument when you're down to the pub with your boys and say, hey, we lost 1-0, but they were the better team. What do you mean? Yeah, dude. No, they the expected, eight expected goals, yeah, yeah, bro. Exactly. We, we basically won 9-1. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the thing that I would really like to see, I think it was like three, maybe four years ago, there was like like Daryl Murray at Sloan Conference. Okay. And, and Daryl Murray, of course, one of the analytics uh, gurus yeah. in, the, in the NBA and one of the first ones to, to really have run the Houston Rockets back when he was the Houston Rockets GM in a very analytics focused style and and he talked about football so soccer analytics for Euron um, and he said look there is so much wrong in football analytics for instance there is so much focus back then at least on possession but possession doesn't score goals so why should you focus this much on on possession for instance and he had like like a lot of beef with the state of football analytics back then and so i would uh, and back, back then he said like i guess more jokingly than than really he would probably after the rockets drop uh, uh, do something around football that would be interesting to him as we can see now, he didn't. But uh, yeah, that would be that, that would be exciting to me. Actually, uh, Daryl Morey um, does own a football club now. He floated. We'll go again back to Web three. Uh, Wagme United. Uh, I don't know if you okay. W A G Wagme, which is of course Web three parlance. Uh, Wagme United bought uh, a DAO, which bought a club, uh, and Wagme United was uh, headed by Daryl Morey, um, Gary Vaynerchuk and a couple of other celebrities. And they bought over, I think it's Colchester uh, FC in the Premier League. So yeah, he eventually did come into, into football. He's there. A natural progression, right? <laughs> Something like... Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess Craw so. Craw so okay, Crawley, we're... Town, Crawley Town, sorry, is the team that they bought. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we were we were about to get into into a big important sports tech development slash trend um your, your floor. <laughs> okay, it's just uh, another one. Um, okay, we're, we're, I mean, there are a couple that I can talk about um, and I'll try to do them briefly. We touched upon this a little bit, uh, the advent of, of VC money and there's more money coming into the game. And as, um, as teams are being bought over, by, by VC funds. You're seeing a lot of Italian uh, teams. It'll never happen in Germany. The 50 plus one rule um, yeah. prevents that from happening. We're seeing the Americanization. Ron, you used that phrase earlier. Uh, the Super League, for example, uh, was backed by, I think it was uh, JP Morgan or something. Who JP was, Morgan, yeah. yeah two, two billion. The Cronky, I think the yeah, Cronky, the Cronky family, family is in on that. But it was yeah. these guys, private money, basically, which was funding these greedy ambitions of... Um, of the football teams, which a lot of them had American owners, so it comes full circle, especially the Premier League ones. So we're seeing. Well, I wonder if it's more or less greedy than than uh, UEFA and, and FIFA <laughs> and all the old school football. So <laughs> there is an argument to be had, at least. True. I mean, I, I, in terms of the governing bodies, UEFA and FIFA, I don't think there are across sport. You'd be hard to find more corrupt governing bodies. Um, so them aside, but at least. Like if you go back, I mean, there's always been money coming into football. I always use the Premier League as an example. But in 1992 or 93, Jack Walker, when he took Blackburn to a Premier League title, and this is a small team like Blackburn, this is this is Walker's millions, right? But Jack Walker, when he he was a local guy who made money, was successful in his career, came, bought his local club, pumped in a lot of money, bought Alan Scherer, bought Chris Sutton, bought a good team. But did that with not really the expectation of making multiples of money out of the sport. He he, ha he was a rich guy who who loved sport and it was like his little play toy. So he played with it a bit. And they won, which is great. Uh, got to Roman Abramovich many years later, where you kind of had a similar feeling, but this was just a bit of a play thing and he was just, this is a bit of money that he has and he's messing around. Of course, Roman is much smarter than 
and then he then any of his thought he was because he took that one and a half billion that he's put in and current sentiment aside he would have made a profit of two or three billion dollars on that initial investment um but now it seems to be changing because not just in football we can talk about this in sports cvc capital for example invested in the all blacks the new zealand all blacks right so that's private capital taking coming into the national team this is not like the premier league is still a private uh, private run body the new new zealand rugby is being invested into by uh, cvc capital right fiba which is the international basketball association um also had cvc capital uh, put money there silver lake uh, put money into manchester city um it's, and there are tons and tons more, of more example elliot capital so what's the explanation why is all this big even institutional money or or at least bigger private equity funds seeking out sports i mean i have my theory but i'm curious to learn yours sure i mean i, I think one thing is self evident which is that they believe these assets are undervalued right and a vc is only coming in to make multiples of money on the money that they invest right they're not doing it because they want their local team to go win a title no they're doing it because they they have uh, x amount of the invest now within a 3 5 7 year cycle or whatever the fund cycle is they want that return so they believe any investment whether it's a startup whether it's a team whatever it is they believe that it has the potential to return them that multiple on capital so they believe that these assets have tremendous upside that's number 1 number 2 i think they believe that european and other sporting assets are much cheaper than what they would do in the us right i mean us across the leagues um i mean the, the amount that uh, i think was 300 million or something um that was a valuation for fiba this is international basketball is valued at 300 million or something and that seems like a, like a joke when you think about what us uh, individual franchises even the shittiest franchises i don't take the charlotte hornets or something um are worth uh, a billion a billion and a half right um so they believe these european and other uh, foreign uh, sports assets are undervalued they think the upside is strong and they have a blueprint um for how they think they can extract money a great example is liberty media and what they did with formula 1 um private money came into a dying sport and has revived it and how so if they get the execution right i think there is there is money to be made sport is sports followings are only increasing they're not going any other way but but that that was a good segue because i think like i mean the question is why do they think sports entities are usually or very often undervalued and i think i think you need to take a, a macro perspective on on this topic and and see the role that that sports currently currently plays in in what i once called the attention economy and i mean i i didn't invent the term but i had a publication using this term because because that is really where where sports is so interesting from from today's macro let's call it media landscape or attention landscape because because it it is one of the key challenges not only for for media companies and brands to get to get the people's attention but but also for basically every company out there any advertiser needs to needs to compete in this increasingly fragmented segmented uh, world of of attention and and shorter attention spans and and you compete with Instagram and there is no such thing as like the, the we have five tv programs and we that th that is like a communal event everybody watches the same right and and sports promises to do this up to up to a certain extent and and even if pr pr my personal belief is like these these super super the time of super big reach is over even in sports we will see more fragmentation because there is the zone and you can get super deep into darts or so on because it's always on and you can follow these sports that used to be much more more niche but then they are super captivating right like like probably it's less people overall but they have these strong relationships and to two people and and these strong relationships are definitely more valuable than ever because it is the way how you can uh, how you can then sell stuff to advertisers how you can sell directly to to consumer and so on and so forth and this would be my theory on on a macro level why so much money is seeking out sports and then let's see who are the winners of of tomorrow whether it's fever or yeah just quickly piggybacking off that thomas uh, another 
pretty big element to it is that, I mean, Gen Z and like the, the younger generations, they tend to only want to buy products or trust brands that influencers push, right? And that includes athletes. You know, a lot of younger fans are following athletes rather than teams. There's no like franchise loyalty anymore for a lot of like the younger generations. So I think because these brands and advertisers know this, there's like an incentive to get into sports because, you know, athletes represent some of the most, I mean, w- when you were young, who, who were like your heroes for me? It was athletes. It was Kobe Bryant. You know, it was LeBron James. Like those were the guys, like the Ronaldos, the Messis. And I think like, yeah, it, 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 that's what speaks to these younger generations. And it's, it's, it makes sense, you know, why a lot of money is flowing that way. Yeah. Can't, can't argue with anything that you guys say. Completely agree. I'll add two points to that. One is that, and this has been true for a while. Again, no new thought from my side, but sports has become the last, last passion of predictable viewing because sports is almost the last thing that people will tune in live to watch. Nobody yeah. watches, uh, any sort of, um, content true. on um I mean, and, 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 and youtube live and things like that exist but not at this scale right um that's that's number one number two the fanaticism that sports brings in terms of the following that it has there are very very few products and if you think of sports as a product there are very very few products where no matter how shitty it is no matter how badly it's executed no matter what like the user or the fan consumer will not go anywhere. They are locked in for life. Right. And so the, the LTV yeah. of that, again, I hate to think of fans as consumer because I'm a sports fan. We all are, but that's, these are the metrics. So you think about what you can get out of converting one sports fan onto your team or onto your sport. You've got them for life, not them, not just them, their kids, their grandkids, like you, they will find different ways to create touch points, right? So the sports, so private money is understanding this now until 10 years ago, certainly European sports, maybe, maybe American sports was faster, but European sports was a mom and pop shop, like a lot of the time. Italian football went yeah. into ruin because it was mom and pop shops um, and private money running it, right? Families running it basically, but that's changing now. Um, with that comes a lot of good. Of course, the teams get more professional. There are better career sports, Traditionally, it's not been a good paying career. That's changing now. It attracts better talent. Um, the product gets better. The uh, the on-field effects get better. There's so much more money coming in. Bad side is that as a fan, you're getting squeezed for every dollar, every euro that, that you're willing to spend. Um, but again, coming, and those are the kind of opportunities, and there are different ways to do it. But again, Web3 offers opportunities to create tiers in that fandom because earlier that you know all the fans can buy a ticket to the game all right you can get into the game then you created corporate boxes and stuff okay the richer fans can go sit there but everybody else sits here um, with maybe a small difference in price depending on where you're sitting but now you can add in between let's hey you can't afford a corporate box which costs two thousand euros but you you can pay more than a hundred euros for a seat so, you know, pre-match, spend 500 euros, go to the player's lounge, hang out, get, grab a drink. And, okay, so it was creating tiers already. Now, there are more ways and more tiers that you can create, create more individual experiences, personal lives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, that, and that's where this is going, clearly. Yeah, definitely. So, so I mean, that's a great segue to finally talk a bit of Web3 NF, NFTs. And I think with this tiering and, and a, seg- a tool to create more segmentation in your, in your fan base, definitely one interesting sub point. But before we, before we go a bit deeper on this one, what, what is like your, 2022, it's the end of June take on the space and how, how, how it has been used in the sports industry to this day. I, I, I think putting a timestamp on it is, is, is very important because uh, how da- dynamic the whole thing is. Um, look, I mean, right from the beginning, there aren't two, I don't, I'm not a big NFT owner. I was, I've never been a big collectibles guy. Um, so I wasn't huge to jump on the hype wagon and I wasn't going crazy on Topshop, uh, NBA Topshop when it first launched. But I immediately saw the use case. Um, and I think that that's real. I, I mean, 
just for example, the first use case was just purely digital collectibles, right? That was that yeah. was it. It was just very simple, um, whether it's 2D images or 3D video, call it whatever. But I own this piece. I own this moment in history. And that was the first use case. Now we're seeing other more ancillary use cases. Um, so rare to get a fantasy with, it seems like, middling success. Um, they've had tokens, which we can talk about. And I think that's a poison. I think that that the, the token economy, especially what the team tokens that have been created with, with Socio specifically, I don't mind saying them, but I think that's really dangerous because it entices an average fan to buy with sentiment, but not participate in any of the speculation because that's out of their control. Like the gaming of these tokens is happening. It's got nothing to do with what the teams are actually doing. Um, so I think that's dangerous. Um, so we'll leave tokens out of it. Um, then you talk to uh, talk about other applications. Like I said, I think NFTs was just the first use case. I think there are more more intelligent use cases to come. Um, like we saw the Australian Open. I, I thought that was one of the best um, uses of NFTs to create kind of engagement. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, the Australian Open did launch a program called Artball, A-R-T, Artball. So they had these, I think it's 6,776 if I remember correctly, but they basically divided a tennis court into basically the size of a ball, right? So tennis court lined up with, with grids, which are balls. And there are, what is it, 11 championship finals. So there's men's final, women's mm -hmm. final, men's doubles, women's doubles, in mix singles, some junior categories, whatever, they're 11. So there are 6,776 balls that are launched as NFTs you can buy and bid for. If your ball becomes the match winning point on any of those championship games, obviously maybe the men's and women's finals are more important than the uh, junior finals or mixed doubles final. But if, that, if you own that NFT, then you get all sorts of great access. You come into the open. You have you, so you've got a moment in history. Uh, so you saw like I own the NFT for which Rafa Nadal won. You know his uh, I think whatever it was twenty twenty twentieth uh, Australian Open or something. And um, so and it, so it creates good engagement, right? Uh, we've we've seen good use cases like that. We've seen. Um, uh, play to earn, uh, move to earn, like step in, uh, which is an, again, uh, NFT based, uh, movement, um, application, which got a lot of notoriety because their co token, uh, increased in value. Um, so you earn while moving. Um, and there's a sports metaverse. So we, so we can go on and on, but we've seen interesting applications of it already, but I think we're super, super early, um, in, in what Web3 can do because at the core of it, the functionalities are, are, are really interesting. Smart contracts, I think, is a big one. Is the biggest one. Um, decentralized apps, etc. Yeah, we can keep going, but I think NFT I mean, is, is a wave that we might be a little bit past now. I, I definitely have to agree on the on the point that we are super early. I, I guess I have to push back on the on the token point a bit. Not maybe so because it, I, I I'm in a bit of a complicated position and I don't want to talk about about at least perceived competitors. Uh, so so let's not talk about the specific company you mentioned but but just in general i i do believe there are ways to use tokens as a cool tool for for fan friendly stuff and sure. there are other ways i mean you mentioned earlier dao and and there are different concepts of daos right there are like these highly financialized daos who just put money together in a pot to buy some some asset like for instance a sports team or, or whatever some some uh books or whatnot and and you have this type of DAO, but you also have like this idea of social DAOs and, and more community run things, which I guess is quite compatible with the sports world. And, and that is why I think like, like, like a, one way to implement tokens, and you see this in the, in the broader uh, blockchain, crypto world, DAO world, is to say, okay, that is like a, a, a little thing that may, maybe can, cannot even be acquired. Usually it can be acquired, but, it, but maybe it can only be earned for contributions in a given network. And then, and then it gives you influence over the network. It gives, you, it gives you reputation. It's like a way to quantify reputation in a network. And if you, if you take this theoretical wording down to what could this mean in sports is like again you talked about 
we talked about building these tiers in fandom and yes you can build them by selling more expensive nfts to to individual fans and then they get more get more access but but, but another way and maybe to balance this because that is very monetarily driven is to say okay you create you create models and constructs where your fans for for their their contributions for their activities in like the digital and or the analog world can can earn stuff that they can then use yeah. to to get exclusive access to to maybe have more of a say i mean it's like in traditional organizations right if you have more if you have more shares you more have, have more of a sh say over over this and and the shares for instance can be earned by belonging to the organization for a long time it's it's one way to do so so yeah th that would be my pushback on this yeah no don't get, but we are early yeah don't get me wrong sorry i, I didn't mean to uh, use the same brush to paint or, or token creators i think there is a lot of value in that economy and i, I think it as you rightly said it can be participative it can encourage inclusion etc um but using tokens as a financial tool um and 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 make that more speculative to get fans to buy in uh, i think that that has that use case has seen um has been exposed in in a few different ways um yeah but, and and i think yeah. i think what we the, the what the starting point for for all of this needs to be is is like what what is great for fans what do fans actually mm. want to do right because, because nothing can be done and that is like to to me in the history of of not necessarily sports tech at large, but at least like like rights holders venturing out into into tech projects, into digital projects. You see, I, I believe a, a pretty high failure rate because they are not the user experience designers by by default. Even though to succeed in the digital attention economy, to bring back this term, they would they would have to be this. And some some. Uh, much better than others, right? Yeah. Like like uh, so, some leagues, some teams really really succeed at that. And I guess the the leading the best sports brands of tomorrow, or, or at least of in ten fifteen years, they will be the ones who today understand how to how to build experiences that are really good for fans and then the entire web3 stuff is a interesting instrument to to build these better fan experiences these more engaging I mean, fan experiences it goes back to that gamification topic right it's like how how can sports teams and sports brands garner the interest and the engagement of their fans outside of just when the the teams are playing like how do we keep their attention on a 24 hour because at the end of the day, isn't that what every brand wants to do? Isn't that what TikTok wants to do, Facebook, Instagram? It's like, how do we keep our users paying attention for as long as possible? And I think yeah. that's what kind of tokens can help do. It's like this this gamified way where fans can like interact with the brand on a different level outside of the sport. And yeah, I mean, of course, I tend to agree with, with both of you guys. So yeah i think the, to to create as you said different forms of engagement which are not just connected to the live event that's uh, that's yeah. one of the many holy grails in sport and i think um, these are good ways to do that i mean i think the idea of involving the fans so there are a few different ways i, I can speak to for example there is uh, entire league which is formed of this uh, using american football uh, the fan control football league um has been has got a lot of press there in their third season we had them on our podcast um earlier this year and which is just that like allowing fans to call plays right so not just not just using uh fans to vote on the third jersey of the team or to what song plays when the team walks out on the field which is yeah sure that's a little fun stuff and it creates a bit of engagement and stuff but it's it's too trivial yeah, it's just fluff right it's just fluff yeah um but no maybe you can use your tokens um to actually say that hey this is the play that we have this is what we have to call this is who in the context of football um and and, and 
by the way, I still call it football, no? And soccer is not my thing. I'm not American, but... I call it football now, too, man. I've been here for now four years. <laughs> no, Thomas, Thomas told, it's football. Thomas oh, you told me out earlier. I was like... Yeah. Oh, no, no. That that was not that was not Ron. That was Ron. Because ah, Ron is the U.S. guy <laughs> got here. It, got it. I, maybe I misheard. But yeah, he they are close. To little, he likes to take, take little digs little at, at MI. <laughs> That's what makes a good podcast, man. Um, yeah. yeah, but... But again, so take it, allow fans to make more. So in the context of football, who's our set piece taker, blah, blah, blah. Now, are you really going to start allowing fans to vote on that in <laughs> in in a, in a league game or in the Bundesliga and a DFB Copa final? No, yeah. probably it ain't going to happen. Yeah, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. But Roan. But I mean, there are, have, there are formats that you can. See, on a friendly, like, et cetera, have, sorry. I have a handful of friends, maybe 10 guys who all think they know exactly what play to call in exactly every situation. This is the best way, way to call those bluffs. Yeah. I want to put their money where their mouth is. And like, <laughs> not just that. Let's see if it, not just that. Actually, the same as you guys, I'm sure. So I have a couple of, so there's the inner group of, of my boys who, who are fans of different clubs. And some of us, are my, I'm a Man United fan. So it's been a great time for me. Um, so, and there's a wider group of United fans that I'm a part of. Right on WhatsApp or other other channels, and the kind of shit that these guys talk, it's retarded. From their couch, yeah, eating potato it's, chips, it's like, drinking beer, dude. I mean, it makes makes beyond no sense. It's like what, like you literally contradict. Like last week, you were shitting on that player, like said he's the worst thing ever, and this week because he scored a he's pure class, he, he scored a freak goal because the ball came off his ass and went in. Now he's the oh yeah. man, he's a legend. And he's, pure class, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so, I mean, you get you get all of these kind of fans. So I was um, I was having that chat uh, yeah. with with the CEO of FCFL. Like, how do you qualify? And maybe tokens and earn the ability to earn tokens and and. Like, how do you acquire this knowledge? How do you qualify yourself as a learned fan? Um, and these are ways, like, you go through some classes or go through some quizzes or go through some some courses. I don't know, whatever. Because yeah. it's very hard to believe that a fan sitting at home who has a different job and doing something else in their career spends maybe four hours of sport in a week, maybe 10 hours, whatever you want, versus somebody who's doing this full-time for the last 20 years, has won trophies, has won medals, but no, I, I think I know more than yeah. come on. Like that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I think because he played FIFA. <laughs> there, are different, there are different areas where that makes more sense. Yeah. I mean, like like un, unless you would be be privy to all the same kind of information, right? The co coaches also with the players all day long with the team. So there is practical stuff yeah. that you just cannot scale. I mean, probably you could follow players twenty four seven with video cameras, and that would be I mean GDPR. Let's not talk about this angle, but it's coming, yeah. It's so there would be ways to to do this. I I as I know that you have to run soon i would just get to the to the final question which to me is like, maybe we are opening another can of worms but then at least it's uh, you are by, by your own doing okay. so i mean you follow the sports tech market super closely since uh, since a long time and i wonder if you would be starting something right now in Ooh. this realm what would it be where would you put what, what would you find so interesting that you would say this is it or would be it man that's a great question i haven't thought about that in a while actually the funny thing is i mean i'm not trying to buy time but the funny thing is that that was the intention with which we started doing sports tech x at least for me it was like hey doing oh, really? market research is the best way to study the market to at some point in time um enter it yeah and come up with an application yeah. that that maybe you can think and scale etc Got to what three four years later, we're still doing the research. Uh, <laughs> not, not because of anything else, it's just because we found that there was this niche for people who are doing this research, and that had its own value. And so that was the startup that I that I landed it. But the intention was to answer Thomas's question, okay. which was like, hey, so if maybe if I study it deeper, and somebody's you know we can manage to get some money along the way and people to pay us, uh, that would be an interesting one. If I had to pick an area, if you're putting me on the spot, I will answer the question. Um, I think it has to be Web3 connected. I, I would pick um, an area which probably has the most amount of scale uh, and has good applications in Web3 is uh, where probably this conversation started, which would be something along the lines of fantasy or betting on in, in Web3 because I think it, it ticks a lot of boss boxes. It creates, it, it benefits from all the other applications 
or the the nice aspects of, of Web3, the uh, the uh, accountability. Well, accountability is maybe not accurate, but the visibility, uh, the clarity that Web3 gives you, um, still behind the uh, the face of anonymity. Um, but also it gives you transactions which can scale if you have a good product that will execute well with real money so you good products will really find scale quickly in in sports betting and i think there is a global wave to it um if i had to pick one it's not the mo i think but it doesn't sound like the most innovative but there's a lot of a really cool innovation that's happening within the sports betting space and also the applications within web3 to take it to esports to take it to different sports um yeah, I think that would maybe I'll, be the one. I would have said the same. I would have said the same thing. It's the most, it's the most direct B to C. Yeah, that also. type of thing. So consumer, it, it has reaches scale, the biggest. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yep. But, and, and which, sorry, which sport would you pick then? Because <laughs> uh, I guess you cannot start with all of them at once. Well, I um, actually, I think my sport of choice would probably be cricket. Um, only because, again, A, it's a sport I grew up playing first. It's the first thing I ever played. Um, but B, again, it answers all those questions of scale, et cetera. If I can, if I can understand a market like India, where, and I, India's unique in a lot of ways, where people are fanatical, but they're also super price sensitive. So how do I break my economics down to be really effective and profitable at very low, um, uh, 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 so average revenue for users and average profit for users and those kind of metrics. If I can crack that, then to scale up is easy. Um, and to take those metrics and scale them. It's a black box. Yeah, yeah. So it, I, I think yeah. I think that would be interesting. My sport of choice is still football. It's the one that I most avidly follow. Um, but I think the connections to India would, would take me back there. Yeah, That's and I guess cr cricket is probably, I, I don't know, I'm not super familiar with the cricket market. By the way, first guest appearance yeah. on the Liquidity Cast by my son, who just ran in here holding two basketballs, actually, small basketballs. <laughs> um, so, yeah, go, go grab them. Um, no, it, very interesting choice. And uh, maybe, I, I don't know if you told it on your podcast, but but I was tricking you because the really last question, of course, is just stealing from you. What's what's your favorite sports moment? Ah, okay, we're doing that. Um, oof, that's tough. Uh, I have to pick a couple. I have to pick uh, um, Man United in '99 at the at the Camp Nou versus by uh, yeah, of course. I remember yeah. it's so painful. I, and funnily enough, for me, that was I didn't really understand it at the time because. That was my first season of being a United fan. It was, it was just like that. So I just thought the world is always like this. And we just win everything. All, <laughs> we just win everything all the time. Um, because yeah, they were the first team that was covered uh, um, on Indian TV. So I picked that, and um, I have to pick a moment from cricket. Uh, Mahindra Singh Dhoni, our Indian cricket team captain, smashing a six out of the park, basically like a home run, uh, it, to win the 2011 World Cup um, at home in. In Mumbai, I wasn't there, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, that, that, I'd probably nice. pick those two. Cool. Nice. Hey, thank you so much for jumping on on the Liquidity Cast and uh, looking looking forward to uh, talking again in the hopefully not too distant future. Yeah, that that was fun, guys. Good chat. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Ron.